I've got the fastest, most powerful CPU ever produced. The brand new Threadripper Pro 7995WX with 96 cores and 192 threads. And I was going to do one of those standard benchmark episodes, but I know in advance that the first question in the comments is actually going to be, can it run Doom? And yes, of course, it can run Doom. But can it run 100 copies of Doom all at once? We're going to find that out today and a whole lot more right here in Dave's Garage. Maybe you try it. Hey, I'm Dave. Welcome to my shop. I'm Dave Plummer, a retired operating systems engineer from Microsoft, going back to the MS-DOS and Windows 95 days. And today, we're going to start with an experiment that's completely useless but very entertaining. We're going to run 100 copies of Doom, all rendering live on the screen at the same time. Can the new Threadripper Pro 7995WX handle 100 copies of Doom? And if so, what kind of frame rate will we get? Will we max the CPU or the GPU, or where will be the ultimate bottleneck? It's time to take a look. Let's meet the system we'll be running it on, the new HP Z6 G5A workstation. This is the HP Z6 G5A workstation. And when I say workstation, I mean it. It ships with the new Threadripper 7995WX Pro, the 96-core, 192-thread CPU, as well as 128 gigabytes of RAM and an A4000. Now you'll see the construction inside is quite unlike your regular desktop PC. It's very well thought out, very well built, and generally everything is toolless operation when it comes to doing things like adding an expansion card. The Z6 sports 10 gigabit networking out of the box, but I have 25 gigabit here in the lab, so I'm going to throw a Mellanox dual port 25 gigabit card in. Simply remove these to be able to get access to the PCI slots. That first set of tabs that I flipped down actually retains the PCI card, so there's no need for screws to retain things in your expansion slots. And here's the Mellanox cord that I will be installing. As you can see, it has two SFP28 ports on it, which I will put optical transceivers in at least one of, and then route a fiber optic cable onto the next machine in the network, where I will bridge the network to avoid having a switch in between them. And with the card dropped into the slot and the tabs pushed back in to retain it, everything should be ready to go. All we need to do is add fiber. With the hardware ready to go, it's time to set up the server side. The first thing we need to do is find a copy of Doom that runs on Windows 11, which turned out not to be trivial. Initially, I just expected that I could run multiple copies of Doom 95, but I had trouble getting that to run at all. You have to rename DirectX DLLs and do some various shenanigans, and I still had no luck ultimately getting it to go. What I ultimately found was a version of Doom that runs as a web server, and you simply point your web browser at it. Each browser window causes a client to spin up another instance of the game. Since the game auto-plays into a demo mode a few seconds later, all we have to do is spawn a ton of browser windows pointed at our own Doom server. Now, it wouldn't be fair if the Doom server was running on another machine, so rest assured it will be all running on the same machine. But I've compiled the Doom server for Linux, and so I'll be running it under Ubuntu 20.04 LTS under Hyper-V. Thus, the servers and the clients are actually in different virtual machines running on the same physical machine. First, I activated Windows Hyper-V, and then I installed the Ubuntu LTS server alongside Windows. I next set up Docker under Ubuntu, which allowed me to launch the Doom server with a single command line, which I'll include in the video description. To do that, I'm going to write a simple Python script that launches all the instances, instead of doing it by hand, each in its own individual instance of Chrome, and then tile them so we can kind of see what's going on. So the first thing we need is some kind of Python script to launch all of our instances, so we don't have to do it by hand. This is our script. The first things we define are the launch URL to the Doom server and the number of instances, which in this case I'll just set to 100. Then we're going to launch 100 instances of Chrome by running through this loop 100 times and starting with a new window, an instance of Chrome pointed at the Doom server. Once all 100 instances have been created, we wait 20 seconds for everything to stabilize and then we get a list of windows. We then run through each window and tile it, trying to put about 15 on each row and 10 on each column giving us about 150 instances on screen, and we can tweak that to get as many as we want, they'll just be smaller. And with that, we can pick a run Python file in Terminal and let it launch all 100 instances. They will launch at just default screen positions, and then our code will catch up and tile them momentarily. And once the windows are tiled, we can see we've got 100 instances of Doom, and they're all running at what looks to be pretty much full frame rate. We can bring one of them forward here and start a new game, pick some menu options, 
And you can see we can run around just fine and everything's running at a reasonable frame rate. And so as you can see, the Threadripper 7995WX can run 100 copies of Doom with no problem. In fact, it's hovering around 6-8% CPU total, and the GPU is around 24%. So if it could run 100 copies with no problem, what about more? What about 500 copies? Well, let's give it a shot. To make that change, we simply change the 100 constant to a 200 constant. We'll run it again, see how it does, and then up it from there if we can. I'll increase the delay to 30 seconds here, which I will fast forward through so you don't have to watch it. And when we launch it, you can see it's kicking off 200 copies of Chrome. Those will all then load, and in a few moments, they should nicely tile out. And now we just wait for the script to go through and tile all the windows, and we wait for the magic to happen. Now, because I don't really know how to scale a game like Doom in a browser instance, I can only just tile them and watch the top left corner. I've kept it down to this many on screen, but we know that they're all rendering. And if I tab around, you'll see that each one, every game I randomly pick, will be running at its... Is this still the full frame rate? Yeah, I think actually it is. It's certainly playable at this point with 200 copies. Let's see how it goes when I run down here. Let's, how are we doing for CPU? 10% CPU. About 20% GPU. And we're at about 32 megabytes of memory total. Everything's still running nicely. Well, if it can handle 200 and the CPU is still only at 10%, let's just go up to 500 right away, see how that works. I'm not rebooting or even restarting the server instance, so I'm simply going to the icon, pick and close all windows, and letting Windows recycle all 200 processes. So, with 200 copies of Doom, and now we'll change this to 500 by updating the constant. A fair bit of stress on the old NT kernel, but it seems to be handling it quite nicely. And so I'll kick off the script, and we'll see how it handles 500 copies of Doom. And as you can see, the answer is not so well. Every single instance seems to run fine, but uh, there is a lot of graphics action that's simply not happening here, whether individual instances are not rendering, but you can see we're missing icons. So it seems like we're probably out of handles of some kind, or out of window objects, or GDI objects of a particular type. Not quite sure. There's a lot of everything going on here, so it's hard to tell exactly what it's run out of. Still, the individual instances play pretty well. I think this is still full frame rate, which is actually very surprising of the ones that are actually running. Now that we've had our fun with Doom, we should take a look at some more serious benchmarks. My go-tos for benchmarking outside the world of Primes usually start with Geekbench and then Cinebench, so let's start there. I'll be using the newest version of Geekbench, which is actually version 6, but I'll test two versions of Cinebench, both R23 and R24. The former will give me more systems to compare to, and the later will allow me to test the GPU. My old Threadripper is a 32-core 3970X, and that's the system that we'll be testing against. We'll also try to put those two numbers into some context by comparing them to where my M1 Mac Ultra Studio shakes out. Let's run some benchmarks and take a look at the results. Now, the first thing I'll want to do is to run the CPU benchmark in Geekbench 6. So we'll kick that off. I'll drag this over so we can see it. I've also got Task Manager open so we can monitor the CPU usage. What we should expect to see is generally one core or close to it pegged because this is the single core workload that it runs first. And so our overall CPU usage with 192 cores available will actually be pretty low. But we should see, as I said, an individual core or two be very busy. Once it has completed all the tests on a single core, it will go through and run them on all the cores at the same time. And that's when we will see all the cores start to flash busy here momentarily during each of the tests. Because this is sped up, you just see a brief flash of activity because it's only a few seconds long for each individual test segment. But because it times it from start to finish, it knows how to calculate the results. And as it nears the end of the test, we should see it throw up a web page. Here we go for the HP Z6 G5A workstation, single core result, and it achieves a single core result of 2609 and 24477 as the multi core result. I'll log in and we can see these results in context with some of my other machines. Now I'll put these numbers in some kind of context coming up, but for now we need to know that it's the highest single core score and the highest multi core score that I've seen. So it's besting, of course, the old Threadripper, but also the 5950X and the M1 Studio Ultra. Once we're back on the desktop, I'm going to run the GPU benchmark. And that will give me a result using the OpenCL library. I've decided not to use CUDA because I can't directly compare CUDA on the Mac, whereas OpenCL, at least you can run it on both in order to get some kind of result to compare the two machines. Sneaking a peek at Task Manager, we can see bursts of almost 100% activity during the actual GPU tests that it's running. 
And we're approaching a final score of 127,589. To put that in some context, I think that's about half as good as the 4080. And so the RTX 4000 scores about half of what the RTX 4080 does in the other Threadripper, as it scores, I believe, somewhere around 225,000. Is that correct? Let's go to the compute results. Sort the other way. Yeah, 227, I think, is the highest. So that is my 4080. And it compares to the A4000 at 129 is the best result I've ever actually captured on the A4000. Of course, no testing of a high-core CPU would be complete without throwing Cinebench R23 into the mix. Here you can see the real-time performance. This isn't sped up. This is 192 cores in action, and it rips through one of these frames in quite a hurry. Now, if you've noticed the countdown timer, you can see this test has a little more than 9 minutes to go, so I'm going to jump to the very end. And you can see we produced a score of 102,793. I have a best with this machine of about 105,000, and so that's right in line with it. Now I'm going to run it again at max load, but this time I'm going to run Task Manager and Hardware Monitor so we can get a sense of what the thermals in the CPU usage are like. Naturally, as we would hope, we see all cores pegged to 100%. Now this chip is only technically rated at 2.5 GHz on all core max, but as we can see, it's keeping up nicely with an air cooler between 3000 and 3200 MHz. And with that, let's scroll up to have a look at the CPU temperatures. It looks like we're hovering around 72 to 80 in that range. There was a brief spike on one core up to 96, but it settled back down to 78 to 80 degrees. I'm going to guess the high CPU temperature on a single core was during a single core workload when it allows a core by itself to do a lot of the work and produce a lot of the thermals. We can see that with all cores busy, we're at 350 watts even, and that is the max TDP that's rated for this chip. And while Cinebench R23 is the best known, R24 adds GPU testing, so just for fun, I'm going to put the A4000 RTX through its paces. And we can see that its interim result is around 11,000 which puts it ahead of the Radeon Pro W6800 and the RTX 2070, and again, it's going to be about half of what the RTX 4080 can do. Interestingly, the A4000 RTX appears about twice as powerful on this GPU test as the M1 Ultra that I have in the Mac. In addition to the synthetic benchmarks, something that's super important to me are compile times for large software projects. To that end, in order to measure build and compile performance, I like to instrument the compilation of the Linux kernel. Clean building the kernel takes about a minute on my 32-core 3970X, so let's see how long it takes on the new 7995WX. So the first thing I like to do is to do a make clean in the project, which ensures that when I do my compilation or my build, and we time it, I'll be getting a complete build, everything fresh. I'm going to specify dash J192 on the command line in order to specify that it should use 192 parallel processes in order to do its build. And as we can see, it's... Got all 192 cores, fully saturated and busy. This is running real time, by the way, not sped up. It really is that fast. Now we're down to the single core work at the end of doing the library and linker work. That runs a little bit slower because it can only run on a single core. And it looks like it comes in at 28 seconds, which is really impressive because the 32 core 3970X took over a minute. That means it's at least twice as fast. With the new Threadripper compiling the Linux kernel more than twice as quickly as the old one, you can see how much performance this workstation brings to the table for anybody doing serious professional work. The RTX A4000 is a more than capable GPU, and it basically slots in between a 3070 and a 3080 in terms of actual horsepower. For serious video editing, you'd likely want to step up at something like the 4080 or the 4090. To round out the benchmarks then, in Geekbench 6, the trusty old 3970X scored a single core score of 1702 and a multi core score of 16187, whereas the new 7995WX ran up a single core score of 2609 and a multi core score of 24477. The Mac M1 Ultra Studio had a single core score of 2312 and a multi core score of 17781. In Cinebench R23, the 3970X scored a best of 42,502, whereas the 7995WX cranked out 104,507 points. Now, I'm not the one to do it, and my motherboard likely doesn't support it anyway. But with this chip, there's plenty of room at the top, thanks to overclocking for those that crave even more speed. If you found today's episode to be any combination of entertaining or informative, please consider leaving a like on the video and subscribing to the channel. I'm not selling anything and I don't have any Patreons because I'm mostly in this for the subs and likes. 
So it would mean a lot if you would consider leaving one of each before you go today. In the meantime and in between time, hope to see you next time, right here in Dave's Garage.